So far, this course has been a course about objects and equations. The first objects were vectors, and I defined, defined various types of vector equations. Then I used vectors to define other objects, such as spans. Systems of linear equations defined loci, which could be written as offset spans. And these offset spans were flat geometric objects, points, lines, planes, and higher dimensional analogs. But mathematics is not just about objects. Mathematics is about transformations, about functions. I have spaces, Rn, with things in them, vectors, spans, loci. I can define functions on these Rn and ask what the functions do to the objects. The idea of functions is familiar to you from calculus and from high school mathematics before that. The new idea here is that functions can act on vectors and output vectors. A function always had an input and an output. Before, those inputs and outputs were numbers. Now they can be vectors. A function f from Rn to Rm takes an n-length vector and assigns to it a new m-length vector. What does this look like? Well, it looks like a function of the components of a vector. Here are two examples. The first example goes from R3 to R3. When the domain is the same this way, I can call the function a transformation of R3. This function squares all the components of a vector. It's a function. Its input is a vector, it does something to that vector, and its output is also a vector. The second example goes from R2 to R3. Sorry, from R3 to R2. The dimension does not need to be preserved by these dimensions. This one takes the components of a three-dimensional vector and puts them into this combination, x minus y and z minus y, to make a two-dimensional vector. Since the world of single variable functions is already a pretty complicated place, you can imagine that the world of multivariable vector functions is even more brain-boggling, and indeed, it is. The general theory and the calculus of such functions is pursued in the multivariable calculus course. That course takes these new vector functions and tries to understand what derivatives and integrals mean in that context. For our purposes, though, this course is restricted to a special subset of these functions, the linear functions. So what is a linear function? As with many definitions in this course, there is an algebraic definition and a geometric definition. I'll start with the algebra. The two linear operations are vector addition and scalar multiplication. A function is linear if it preserves both, that is, I can do addition before or after the function, and the result is the same. Likewise, if I multiply by a scalar before or after the function, the result is the same. This is a bit abstract, so let me be concrete. Consider the single variable function f of x equals 4 times x. This is just the function that multiplies a number by 4. This is a linear function. Why? Well, because it fits both properties. If I have two numbers, x and y, and I add them and then apply the function, I get 4 times x plus y. I can then distribute the multiplication by 4. These are just ordinary numbers, distribution works, to get 4x plus 4y. But then 4x is the output of f applied to x, and 4y is the output of f applied to y. So this is equal to f of x plus f of y. This shows that adding before or after multiplication by 4 is the same. Likewise, if I take another constant a and multiply x by a and then apply the function, I get 4 times a times x. But multiplication is commutative. These are, after all, just numbers. So this is the same as 4 times x times a, which is the same as a times the output f of x. I can do the same with scalar multiplication before or after. The result is the same. This multiplication by 4 is a linear function of a number. What I've defined is functions of vectors, but the pattern here is quite similar. Here are those rules again, so let me rephrase what is happening here. Since the operations, addition, scalar, multiplication, can happen either before or after the function, mathematicians say that the function preserves the operation, or similarly, it preserves the algebra. Now I can think about geometry. 
What are linear objects in geometry? Well, linear subspaces are flat, infinitely extended objects through the origin. Lines, planes, three spaces. The word linear here again is doing a lot of the lifting. A linear function works well with linear subspaces. It preserves them. By this, I mean that the function sends one linear subspace to another subspace. It sends a line to another line. It sends a plane to another plane, or maybe just to a line. In particular, it can't curve a line into a circle or cut a line up into two pieces. It must preserve the geometry. Flat, infinitely extended things are sent to other flat, infinitely extended things. Finally, a linear transformation must also preserve the origin. The zero vector must always go to the zero vector. So, using this language, linear functions preserve things. They preserve algebraic rules, addition and scalar multiplication. They preserve linear subspaces, sending flat things to other flat things. They preserve the origin, sending the zero vector to the zero vector. I said at the start of this course that symmetry would be a major theme. Symmetry means preservation. Something is preserved under a transformation. In colloquial usage, symmetry is about preserving a shape, the symmetries of a square or a hexagon. In mathematics, Symmetry can be about preserving almost anything, a shape, a property, an algebraic operation. Linear transformations are symmetries because they preserve algebraic operations and geometric flatness. I've covered the major definitions in this first video, but let me finish with a couple of related thoughts. First, like other functions, linear functions can be composed. However, the composition is a bit trickier. For single variable functions, I could try and compose any two functions. For linear functions acting on vectors, the dimensions of the input and the output have to line up. If I have a function f from rn to rm, and a function g from rm to rl, I can compose them, doing f first and then g, and this works because the output of f is the vectors in rm, which matches the input of g. I can't compose them the other way unless the dimensions n and l happen to be the same. Finally, there is a related class of transformations called the affine transformations. These also act on vectors and preserve flat objects. Lines and planes are sent to lines and planes. Linear transformations had to preserve the origin, but affine transformations do not need to. In this way, linear transformations send linear subspaces to linear subspaces, but affine transformations send affine subspaces to affine subspaces. I'm not going to spend that much time on affine subspaces and transformations, but I did want to state the definition. They can mostly be understood by doing a linear transformation and then, then a shift, much like the offset that defines an affine span. Shifts are not that difficult to understand. Most of the complexity is in the linear transformation part. So the theory in this course tries to understand linear transformations with affine transformations just as an aside.